Good morning. Um, I was asked to speak about you Brainworks. Put, put the microphone closer to your lips. This is going to be fun. Okay, so I was asked to speak about different frameworks for implementation science. So I'm going to go through a little bit about uh, the different models and frameworks that exist, and then I'm going to give you the experience that we had in Ignite with one specific framework. I do want to say that my, my starting slides pretty much touch off of what David said, so the idea that implementation is important is that if you go out and you take your research project and you figure out how to make it work for your study, which is what we've been doing for years and years and years, what you figured out is how to make it work for your study. And what you really want to gather is how do you make it work for anybody who wants to do it? And that's where implementation science can create a framework to allow us to do that. So it takes that knowledge that's personal and internal to your project and generalizes it. And a great example of this is Peter Pranavas' study. So some of you may have heard of this. It was a very famous study. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And basically, they went out to 108 ICUs, and they said, we're going to decrease central line infections, OK? And or it's catheter, specific catheter-related infections. And so they said, OK, here's um, a checklist. There's a whole bunch of items that you can do in your ICU that are going to decrease infections. And you guys are going to sit down and implement certain things on this checklist. And then we're going to come back and see how you're doing. And in a year, they had decreased 80% those infections across all sites. That was amazing. Amazing. And so people, he would talk about this. And people would say, what was on that checklist? My god, I need that checklist, right? And he's like, you missed the point. It's not the checklist. It was the process of creating the checklist at each site. They took the items that they thought were most pertinent to their sites, and they implemented them. Everybody did something different. It was the process of bringing those people together, looking at their site internally, figuring out what they could do, and implementing it. That was the key message for implementation science. It's not the what. It's the how. So this is exactly what David put up before. This is how you, so what we've been focusing on until now is outcomes. How you get to outcomes is really important, so we really need to focus on this how part, the implementation part. And um, so I'm going to go through a couple of models here. There are a lot of models, as David alluded to, so I am not going to discuss them in great detail. I'm just going to give you some illustrative ones that have been sort of leading in the field. Um, so this is the PRISM trial, and as you can see, does this have a pointer on it, Paigey? Maybe. The green button? Yes. Ah, OK. So um, it's a little awkward to do this from the speaker's thing here. But so up here, you can see they focus on what's, what are characteristics of the intervention, it, the organization's perspective on the intervention, the patient's perspective on the intervention, who's going to be receiving the intervention, and sort of the characteristics of the organization and the, and the individuals who are going to be on the receiving end. What's the external environment like, um, the, the infrastructure is like, and then going through this adoption, implementation, and maintenance phase that sort of uh, led to the, to the re-aim um, framework later. One thing I would like to say is you're going to see the term models and frameworks a lot here. So the difference between them is a framework just lists you a bunch of constructs that says they are important, but they don't describe any relationship between them, whereas a model says this affects this affects this. So they describe a pathway where those things interact. This is the Paris framework. In this framework, you can see how much simpler this is. It essentially says that if you understand the context and the, the, um, the context has a strong infrastructure for implementing and the evidence base is strong, that you're more likely to have an effective intervention. This is very simple. This is Reaim, and Alana is going to talk to you about this. So I'm not going to go over it um, in any detail, but as David said, there's these components reach effectiveness, adoption, implementation, and maintenance. This is the coordinated implementation model. This is a knowledge translation model. The Canadians love knowledge translation. 
I actually like it a lot as well. And it just describes a pathway for passing off um, knowledge from research to uh, inter to the uh, local system to the broader system and using that to engage all of these key players. So your administrative environment, the personal educational piece to it, the economics, the community, and then at the center is the uh, practitioner. And then uh, there's this one, which is extraordinarily complicated and has many, many pieces to it, but it's very much um, an educational um, model. It's called the Precede Proceed, and it basically has these eight steps. So you start here, and then you go to the um, epidemiology components of it, and then the educational and um, uh, ecological, the administrative and policy, and then you come down to the actual implementation part, a process evaluation, impact evaluation, and outcome evaluation. So there are many, many different models out there that uh, describe different ways you can <clears throat> look at doing implementations using implementation research frameworks. So what I'm gonna to talk to you now about is, is a example. So we used in Ignite, which is the Implementing Genomics and Practice Network, a model to help guide the, the network interactions. And so this model um, was, was the CIFR. We had six projects in this network. Each had a very different genomic medicine intervention. So we had three pharmacogenomic trials, we had um, ours, which was a family history trial. We had Mount Sinai's, that was a disease risk assessment. And then um, University of Maryland had a, a sort of a diagnostic um, for, for Modi for genetic causes of diseases trial. And so they were very different. And so how are we gonna bring together the knowledge and the learning of these different types of, of studies to be able to tell other people who are interested in genomic medicine, how might you do this at your institution? And so we settled on this, um, CIFR, Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. CIFR is a framework. It just lists a whole bunch of constructs. It does not tell you exactly how they interact with each other. They leave that up to you to figure out. But basically, they took a bunch of existing models. So at the time, there was 19, the very um, common implementation models. And they pulled all of the constructs from those models together and said, here's everything. Here's everything that these models say is important. And they just put them into these categories, so they call them domains. Whoops, no, go back. Um, so these are the main domains. So things about the intervention, about the inner set setting, which is sort of the hospital or health system, outer setting, which is your city, your state, your politics, the individuals involved, so the providers, the clinicians, um, patients are actually notoriously sort of absent from this. This is one of the drawbacks of the CIFR. Um, and then the implementation process that you went through um, to, to get your construct. So there are different um, constructs under each of these that they said were important in all of these different models. And so you could go through and select what you thought was, was relevant and then focus on that for your intervention. So what we did was we said, okay, we're all doing different genomic medicine projects. We're gonna, we're gonna go through a process where we're gonna identify what we think as, as the six different projects are very important to in CFER for genomic medicine. And these are the things that we identified as um, high-ranking important constructs for people who are doing genomic medicine studies to, to consider measuring as they do their studies, okay? So the slides are available, so I'm not gonna go through each of these, but uh, we came up with a good number that we thought were very relevant. And in addition, we said, there's some things missing from CIFR. We think these are also important, and we would like people to also think about integrating these with those implementation measures. And as I said, it's largely the patient measures that we're missing from CIFR. Things that we think a lot about already as trialists are who the patient is, what their barriers are, and so on. And so we felt like this was important to incorporate into the CIFR framework. We've actually published a paper on these um, findings, and it was in uh, Genetics in Medicine last year. And at the end, we came up with this draft genomic medicine um, implementation research model. And we said, here are these high priority CIFR constructs and the non-CIFR constructs that we identified. 
we want to everyone to look at the implementation process, and these two things would inform the effectiveness of the implementation and then the clinical effectiveness. And here, what we said is we have this list of things that we identified, but we would like each project to go through that process and identify things that they think are missing from that list or that they would not have on that list. We, we created a draft model with the idea that we would get feedback from people on what uh, they felt should be incorporated and uh, refine it as time goes on. So overall, the benefits of the implementation research are that we can generalize what we're doing in our individual studies, but it also increases the reach of the intervention, so the generalizability, it increases its effectiveness, and it provides a broader framework for assessing health disparities, in particular bringing in those social constructs about patients into the framework. So if you're interested in learning more or you have um, a desire to look at what the different implementation models are that are out there right now, there's a lovely site um, that's at this um, website right here. And it basically lists all of the existing published models. <clears throat> and you can sort them based on different criteria that you have. So I think this is not gonna work, but I had, yeah. So um, I had integrated a, a live version of the website into that, that next slide. But anyway, if you selected the, um, the select button and then you put in search criteria, you can actually come up with different models that might fit the needs of your particular study. So in summary, Including system measures with traditional measures and outcomes will help us create more sustainable interventions. Implementation models and frameworks can be adapted to meet the needs of the genomic medicine community. We feel strongly that they weren't derived with the needs of the genomic medicine community in mind, but they can be developed so that they do meet our needs. And that um, we published this draft genomic medicine model as potentially a starting point for people to think about how to do this in genomic medicine. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank, thank you, Lori. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, so again, we'll uh, um, reserve uh, more discussion-based questions for a bit later. But if anybody has anything, any clarifying questions for Lori, this is a good time to ask them. Great. That means everything was perfectly clear. Um, so. Thank you again. Uh, next up is uh, Alana Ram from uh, Geisinger, and she's going to uh, discuss using the REAIM framework to evaluate genomic medicine implementation. 